I started getting in my news feed, my Facebook feed, a couple of years ago, constant adverts for lenses that would fix my color blindness. And so I started seeing these videos of people getting hold of these glasses that for the first time would enable them with their colorblind eyes to see red when they'd never seen red before or green when they'd never seen green before. And the emotional reaction is just overwhelming. I thought I would love to get some glasses like that because apparently I'm red cone deficient, which means the whole world looks a little bit less red to me than it does to someone with normal sight. I can see red things, but they just don't stand out at me. Or green things, they don't stand out at me. Uh, and so I can miss the differences between things if the difference is red or green. So I'd love to get some of those lenses that will help me see the world, but see it more clearly. Stories are lenses that enable us to see the world around us more clearly. Think about 1984, supreme example of a story that enables us to see the world differently. You read 1984 and you'll have no problem recognizing when an entity or an authority sets itself up as the Ministry of Truth wants to get the people policing each other and telling them to distrust their own judgment. Stories are lenses that help us see things in the environment around us that we might otherwise miss. And ancestral stories are the stories that our ancestors have bequeathed to us to help us understand the world in which we live, to see things that we wouldn't otherwise be able to pick out and to recognize patterns in the past and the present and in our future. Now, Stephen Strong asked me, could I think about what would be the stories that I would want to share in a post-apocalyptic world or stories I'd want to share in this time of shift to ensure that we might live a better life in the future and have a better human experience. And so I'm gonna share some of those stories with you today, just a few. And I'm gonna begin with the story of Uncle Unkulu. Now, Uncle Unkulu is a story that's been curated by the Zulu people. I heard it from Credo Mutwa, the late Zulu elder and storyteller. And the story of Uncle Unkulu goes like this. All animal life on planet Earth came from the stars, arrived on planet Earth in seed pods, landed in a marshy area. In these seed pods were the seed forms of human beings, zebra, antelope, lion, fish, birds, and these seed pods sat there like bulrushes as these forms of life gestated and developed. The first one to bend down and touch the ground because the being inside the seed pod was fully formed was the seed pod containing the first human, Unkulunkulu. And he breaks out of the seed pod, steps out onto the land, and begins going round all the other seed pods, breaking them open, releasing the fish into the rivers and seas, releasing the birds into the skies, releasing the antelope, zebra and lions out into the plains. And so life on earth developed. After a while, Unkulunkulu had released other humans and a human society had formed and then after a time, Mbabwana Warisa appeared, a female entity who taught the humans about the seasons, how to live in harmony with their land, how to work with plants for food, for medicine, and for consciousness. And I'm talking about beer. Mbabwana Warisa is the female who turned up and taught her ancestors how to make beer. And so the story rolls on from there. Now that's a rather intriguing story of beginnings because in some ways it 
answers questions, and in other ways, it raises questions. It says that life came to planet Earth from the stars. But from where? Where did these seed pods come from? Where is the wider family of which we are a part? Who were the senders? Doesn't answer those questions, just tells us to look to the stars for the answers. And what kind of entity was Mbabwana Warisa, if not human? Was she from Earth? Was she from the stars? It doesn't say. And so the story points us in particular directions to ask about our development. What was this external intervention? What were our origins? Gets us looking in the right direction for the answers, but doesn't pin it all down. And yet it's definitely a story with a takeaway, because think about the role of Unkulunkulu. Unkulunkulu is the curator of life on Earth once he arrives. Curious also, the planet exists before the creation story. And that's true in ancestral narratives all around the world. So many of our creation stories begin on a planet that already exists. Unkulunkulu is the same. And so we learn we have this role of curating life on Earth. We look to the stars when we seek our wider family. And the knowledge of Mbab Mwana Warisa teaches us to seek out our helpers, to know that we have help, that we're not alone, that there are others wanting to nurture human society on Earth. I think I'd then tell my hearers that this is a story that repeats, that the Zulu are not the only people who have told these stories of origins in the stars, of helpers appearing out of nowhere on planet Earth to inform our development, to alter our story as a human species. And one place that this story repeats is in the amazing work of Plato, who's already got a mention here today. Now I should say, when I talk about Plato, Plato was writing two and a half thousand years ago, universally acknowledged as one of the greatest minds of all time. A famous British mathematician said you could aptly describe the whole of the Western tradition of philosophy as no more than a series of footnotes to Plato. That's how important he is, how widely acknowledged he is. But when Plato wrote his books, he did it to express the teachings of Socrates. And it's difficult to say where Socrates stops and Plato starts. So when I say Plato, I'm talking about the both of them. So I'll just say that as a preface. I would tell the story of the teacher, Plato, who thought for a long time about how he was going to make a difference to human history. What would his world-changing contribution be? And he wondered for a while if it should be in the world of politics. And then he got old enough to reach a point of total exasperation with politics and lose his hope that that was really going to advance the human story, and he changed his tack to being a storyteller, to writing books that would survive his own lifetime. And so he shifted his attention to changing people's consciousness, helping people to think about the universe in which we live. And so he focused himself on influencing a few people in his own day, and then writing these stories that would last through history to inform future generations, which exact, is exactly what has happened. Now, Plato's amazing knowledge, the reason he has this incredible reputation is that he was able to pull together and synthesize various sources and forms of knowledge and then argue for it logically and rationally and express it in a way that people could understand. And if you read his books, you'll see that what he does, most of what he does is apply logic to things we all observe. So we might call that science or philosophy. He called it philosophy. Logic applied to observation. And by doing that, he's teaching us to think and to think about the universe we all live in. Draw some conclusions. 
And then he also credits ancestral narratives for some of his knowledge. And he talked specifically about going to the world of ancient Egypt, to the knowledge curated by the ancient Egyptian priesthood, which itself had gathered information from around the world and from further east. And in so doing, he's telling us to listen to the old stories, the stories of our elders and the elders of earlier cultures. And he's a case study in doing that. And from that, he gets the most far-reaching information about the history of our planet. He had a pretty fair go at describing what planet Earth looks like in space from a distance. And the way he described our planet, no one had seen our planet, as far as we knew, that way until the 1960s when Apollo 8 took that famous photograph that changed how we saw the planet. Now we realized it was this swirly pattern of white and blue and green and gold. That's how Plato described it. In the 1960s, when we saw that photograph, it should have taken us all back to Plato to ask how on earth did he know that and to listen to him more attentively once again. He said he got some of his information from altered states of consciousness. And he's talking about a psychoaffective tea that was popular in Greece at that time. And it was a curated experience that gave him contact, so he believed, with beings in other dimensions. And so now we're getting into the kind of information that comes through shamanic traditions and mystical traditions. And in sharing that information so openly, and he says, I've drawn conclusions from this experience. So he is teaching us to learn to shift our consciousness, for us to seek out our guides through mysticism and shamanism. So having told the story of Plato, I would then share the great story that he shared. He said that in the beginning was a unified field of consciousness and intelligence. That was his God concept. And that that primordial consciousness then fractalized to form the material universe. Plato said the material universe exists in order to host that consciousness so that the consciousness could express itself and experience itself. Now, this is a mind blowing concept, but when we listen to that in the 21st century, we say, hey, that's quantum because we're doing quantum experiments right now that are showing that consciousness shapes material phenomena. And we're beginning to understand what that relationship is. Plato was there two and a half thousand years ago and he said consciousness came first. And he argues for why it has to be that way. So for Plato, God, the zero point, the unified field is consciousness and that it expresses itself materially. Now, that sounds beautiful, but it might sound very vague and airy fairy. Ask an engineer to explain what that might look like. And the engineer will start talking about panspermia. The theory of panspermia is held to by serious credentialed scientists, particularly in the field of DNA research. Francis Crick, the co-discoverer of the double helix of DNA, believed in panspermia and he taught it from the 1960s on. Carl Sagan was a huge fan of this theory and really championed it back in the day in the 1960s. Today, there are very eminent scholars in the field of DNA research. I think of Maxim Makukov, Vladimir Sherbak of the Fezenkov Astrophysical Institute, the Kazakh Al-Farabi National University at the top of their field in DNA research. They argue for panspermia. Panspermia says, that the genetic coding for biological, conscious, intelligent life has been seeded throughout the cosmos. And that whenever that genetic coding lands in an hospitable environment, that means on a planet with water, it will generate forms of life similar to those with which we're familiar 
on planet Earth. What that says is that we are part of a cosmic family, that we are all related, and that if we have contact, we shouldn't be too surprised if we're somewhat similar, as well as being somewhat different. Well, this is what Plato taught two and a half thousand years ago. And that wasn't the end of our story, he said, because he talked about us developing happily on planet Earth, and then some mysterious others arrive work with our ancestors, genetically modify our ancestors, adapt us to have a greater capacity for consciousness and intelligence, and ultimately to become the technological alpha species that we are today. Now, here's interesting. Just like Mbabwana Warisa, Plato doesn't say exactly who or what these other entities are or where they've come from, but they've come from space, they've not come from Earth. He calls them children of God, but he doesn't say exactly what their genus is or who or what they are, just that they were the ones who came, maybe more than once, to modify our ancestors and to nurture the story of Homo sapiens sapiens. Plato tells a great story of consciousness, that in the beginning consciousness was the one thing, there was just the cosmic consciousness. Then it fractalizes into this material universe and we experience it as separate conscious beings. And this has been done to wrestle with a great question. As separate conscious beings, can we do consciousness, intelligence, harmony, in the same way as when we were a unified field, can we do it as separate beings exercising free choice? And that's the great question of life. It's the question the cosmos is asking of itself. And it's really a question to each of us at an individual level. Am I learning consciousness, intelligence, and love in my lifetime? Plato's idea is that we have all come into being to wrestle with this question individually and collectively. We are on a great learning journey so that we can pool the experience and pool the learning. It's the original hero's journey from harmony out into this world with all the things that happen here with lessons to learn and then we come back together and we pool the learning. It's the original hero's journey. Joseph Campbell, of course, finesses that understanding a little further. And the hero's journey gives us a lens by which we can understand every story. A few years ago, I was preaching through uh, Genesis uh, in the church that I was working in. And I taught on Adam and Eve and Abraham and Sarah and Moses, Joshua, King David, Saul, and I realized it was all the same story being told over and over again. It was all the hero's journey. So the hero's journey gives us a lens by which to understand every story, the story of Genesis, of Buddha, of Jesus, of Lao Tzu, and it's a lens by which we understand our own lives. Plato, in that story, gives us a sense of direction and meaning for our lives, that we're here to learn something. We're here to learn consciousness, intelligence, and harmony, or what we would call love and justice. And he says, while we're doing this, it will help us to shake off all the things that detract from that, to shake off what he called the heavier emotions, things like hatred, ambition, selfishness, resentments, unforgiveness, rage. These things spoil our experience, he says, spoil our lives, spoil our ability to do intelligence and love, and also spoil our journey hereafter. These heavier emotions also make us very easy to manipulate. And so part of Plato's um, teaching for us is to learn not to be manipulated, but to have a better human experience. Once again, there's detail we might be interested in that's missing from what Plato says. Just like in the story of Uncle Nkulu, Plato doesn't tell us how consciousness becomes matter. 
but he tells us to look in that direction. He tells us two and a half thousand years ahead of time to get into quantum and understand what we're seeing. Plato's story doesn't tell us who the interveners were in our evolution as a species, but he tells us where to look for an answer, tells us to look off planet, tells us to look at what we would call paleo contact, which is the field my books are into, the scars of Eden and escaping from Eden is all about that. And Plato's story importantly gives us these directions to consciousness, intelligence, love and harmony. And there is a very important takeaway from that because a conscious society can't be led by a fraudster. A socially intelligent society won't be dominated by a demagogue. It's not going to work. A loving, harmonious society can't be divided and manipulated by a xenophobe. It's not going to work. And so there is an importance to Plato's stories for society as well as for individuals. And that's why I think his story is powerful, it's profound, and it's supremely practical. I now want to go somewhere else. We've been to ancient Greece, we've been to Zulu country, we're now going to go to Nigeria, and we're going to sit at the feet of the elders of the Efik people, who also talk about human origins. They tell the story of Abasi and Atai, two advanced beings who came to planet Earth and who nurtured the beginnings of humanity. On their ship, which hovered like an island above the planet's surface, they had a male and a female. During the day, the male and the female would be allowed to wander the Earth, and then, like children, at the end of the day, they would go back to the mother ship where they would be fed and where they would sleep in the quarters provided by a bassi and a tai. And this is how humans live for quite some time until the woman grows out of this. She doesn't want to live dependent like a child anymore. She has matured faster than the male and she has learned farming. And so it is that uh, one day when it comes time to go home for tea, the female says, you can go home if you want to, but I'm enjoying it down here. I'm, I'm farming this little patch of uh, ground. Well, the man didn't know what that was, didn't know what to make of it. But next time he came down, he discovered the woman really had learned how to farm. And this is really interesting. Something is happening with them. They're coming into their own and they fall in love with each other. The man is amazed by the woman's skill and intelligence, her independence. And he says, yes, this is the way to go. I'm not gonna go back to the mothership anymore either. And so they fall in love, they have children, children's children, and the generations begin to form a human society on planet Earth. Well, this is looking good, say a Bassi and a Thai. We can take a break. And so they do take a break, they go off on a long holiday. When they come back, the human population has mushroomed. It's become a civilization. They're building cities. And Abassi and Atai are very alarmed. We've lost control of this, they say. How on earth are we gonna manage the human population now? They're so smart, they're gonna rival us very soon. We cannot control this. And so they have an emergency meeting. What are they going to do? And so it is that Abassi and Atai realize that what they can do is release devices into the environment that will damage the health of the human beings, that will damage their mental health and mental acuity. If we can keep them worried, anxious, and sick, then we can manage them. That's the answer they come to. And so the story goes on from there. Now there's some really interesting takeaways from that story. Doesn't explain who Abassi and Atai are, but they've come from off planet. And they are part of the story of our origins, apparently. They became threatened by how intelligent we were. And so they actually did something to damage human progress. 
That is an element of the story that repeats in cultures all around the world. It's there in the biblical story. It's there in the Sumerian, Mesopotamian stories. It's there in the Mesoamerican stories. And here it is in the story the Epic people have curated. It says that these entities came from off planet. They had advanced technology. They had a craft. They could do GM apparently. And these devices in the environment, well, there's a warning there to look into the environment to things that might be damaging our health, our mental health, lowering our mental acuity. And so it is a story with a warning in it. But there's a positive takeaway from it, and that is that absent of stuff in the environment, we are naturally very smart, intelligent, resilient beings who will progress and progress. Absent of things in the environment spoiling that story. And so there's a call to the hearer to know our identity, to know who we are as wise, conscious beings capable of so much. And of course, there's a little lesson in there as well to the men, to listen to the women. I would then tell a story of dragons. Now we've been to Nigeria, we've been to ancient Greece, we began in Zulu country in Southern Africa. For stories of dragons, we could go all around the world. I would tell my students that our ancestors, way, way back, lived in colonies that were governed over by smoke belching, fire breathing dragons who loved to terrify and dominate and consume innocent humans. And so our ancestors were governed by fear. They lived in fear of beings that were more powerful than themselves. And these dragons warred against each other. They weren't a single demographic. They warred against each other, competed for hegemony and resources, and they would send their humans out to go to war so they could raid each other's territories for the things they liked. And these dragons had a voracious appetite for cattle, sheep, and virgin girls. And so these human colonies had to keep their dragons supplied with all these things. Of course, it wasn't a very happy way to live. Some said, well, that's just the way it is. The weak serve the powerful. Some things will never change. But there were others who saw it differently. Others were saying no. Other ways are possible. And those who saw the possibility realized that if the people would look out for each other and come together and act together, how could the dragons then work with that? And so a movement grew. Human kings for human people, human rulers for human people. And this movement grew until the dragons realized the people had shaken off their fear and were coming together. And because of that unity, they couldn't be governed by fear anymore. And so the dragons retreated to the mountains, but not without warning the human beings, human kings and queens, don't think you'll be getting an easier ride from them. But the dragons retreated. And so we moved into a time of human kings and queens. And well, the dragons were right. It wasn't always very much better. A lot of the kings and queens behaved just like they'd seen the dragons behave. Some of the colonies progressed to the point where the kings and queens started getting rid of the stories of the dragons so that people would forget. Other cultures did it differently. Other cultures pretended there still were dragons and that's why people should live in fear of the kings and queens because the kings and queens acted on behalf of the dragons who could return at any moment and eat them all up. There was a community that pretended to have a dragon hidden in the depths of the biggest tent in their settlement because they all lived in tents in that community. The biggest one apparently had the dragon in it living in deepest darkness surrounded by smoke 
Only when you looked closely, it turned out there was no dragon. It was the priests and the kings and the courtiers who were eating all the edible offerings. All the cows and sheep and virgin girls were going to them because there were no dragons. And so history rolled on in that way for some time. And then one day there came an amazing man, a healer, a teacher, a teller of stories, a restorer, a giver of hope. The people looked to him and said, oh, could we not have a king like this? And they wanted to make him king. But he refused and he said, no, you have no superiors. You shouldn't be serving superiors. You should be serving one another. These strata of importance and rank and authority and subservience, that's no way to live. You are all brothers and sisters. You are all siblings. And as people began to understand him, his hearers, their children, the children's children, so a vision grew of a different way to live and things began to change. Now the punchline of that story is that that is the story of the Bible as you probably recognized it. The Bible is full of these stories of dragons and other entities and the evolution of the human journey. And so I would tell my students that's the story of the Bible as an invitation to go back and read the Bible afresh through a different lens and realize there is a real takeaway from that overarching story. And the story of the dragons is a lens that teaches us to identify abusive leadership, to name it and challenge authority, to distrust untrustworthy powers, to call out priesthoods pretending, to pursue the common good, to understand the power of humanity when we come together and never to allow the few to dominate the many. That's the story of the dragons. Those are the takeaways. And maybe at their initiation, I would tell my students, the story of the dragons is not only in the Bible, it is a true story. And so I would invite them to look and take it as a warning so that we might avoid some of the mistakes of the past. I would tell a story from 13th century India, which gets retold in 14th century Spain. It was popularized in the 19th century by Hans Christian Andersen. And it's the story of the emperor's new clothes. Now, for me, it is a supreme story. I don't have to say anything else because I know you know the story of the Emperor's New Clothes, that you know it, you know what it means. That story is so powerful that it has that kind of resonance, uh, resonance and memorability. You could ask a four-year-old to tell that story and they could tell that story and tell you what it means. Very simple story, that's how simple it is. And yet, if I say the emperor's new clothes, so relevant to 2021, well, as an adult here, you'd have a pretty cluey idea what I'm on about. If I say the emperor's new clothes, the election of 2016, well, some of you would have a pretty cluey idea what I might be hinting at there. It's a simple story, childlike simplicity, and yet, as adults, you would know that it is talking about current affairs, that it is teaching us that people will always be there who will try and sell you something that isn't real. It's a story that tells us to speak up and not to remain silent because we're anxious about being the odd one out or fearful of being regarded as stupid. It's a story that warns us that we should never mistrust our own judgment and choose not to see things happening before our very eyes. 
The Emperor's New Clothes is an incredible story. There's a reason it has survived century after century. There is a wonderful verse in the New Testament from the book of Hebrews, chapters 12, verses 1 and 2. It says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us shake off everything that holds us back and the sins that so easily ensnare us, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Now that's a really interesting verse because what comes before it is that the writer has told dozens of stories of spiritual ancestors. They've all done different things. They've all shown incredible strength, wisdom, resilience, confidence in a variety of ways. He shared all these stories. And then he says, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Now note, he doesn't say since we're preceded by them. He says we're surrounded by them. What does that mean? Does that mean our ancestors are still with us? And if so, what are they doing? The impression given by that verse is they're surrounding us because they're very interested in us and the race we are running. They are there to encourage us, to urge us on. Since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let's run the race marked out for us. And so that verse is an invitation to take an interest in our ancestors. What did they do? What did they learn? How did they get through moments of crisis before? And what's their contribution to us today? We should take an interest in them, that verse says, because they take an interest in us. And what does it mean to be surrounded? Does it mean that there's contact? There's another very interesting verse in the New Testament, 1 John chapter 4, where the writer tells the reader, Test the spirits. Don't believe every spirit that talks to you. And if a spirit comes along, by the way, that rubbishes Jesus, well, don't take any notice of that one. And in that verse, the writer is telling the early Christians to expect that spirits are going to be in communication with them, but to retain their sovereignty as human beings and to weigh things up for themselves. Now, he doesn't say, here again is this vagueness, doesn't say who or what the spirits are. Are they ancestral spirits? Are they interdimensional beings? Are they energy-based beings? Are they material beings like us that communicate telepathically? Are they our higher selves? He doesn't say what these spirits are. He just says they'll be in communication with you. Just be discerning. Just weigh it up. Now, curiously, that practice seemed to have got pushed out of mainstream Orthodox Christianity by the second century of the Common Era. Why is that? It was clearly part of the early Christian experience. Why did it get pushed out? Well, there was a lot of pushing out in the early story of Christianity. There was a narrowing of orthodoxy. And then when the empire took over and militarized that orthodoxy so that if you didn't hold this tightly defined faith, you were a bit of a non-person. You probably couldn't hold a public position. Your books wouldn't be in public libraries. And in fact, you might want to hide the copies in case they get burned because you're now a heretic and an enemy of the state because you're sowing disunity into the monolithic, this is how we all group think in the empire. And that's the story of the Gnostic Gospels and the Gnostic texts. Stephen and Evan, this is where their research began and they've written extensively on this topic. I would recommend reading what they have to teach about the Gnostic stories. Because in the Gnostic stories, there were some very empowering ideas about who we are our potential as human beings 
and the complexity of the cosmos in which we live, the helpers who are available to us, stories of close encounters, stories of travel into the cosmos, those stories were literally buried in the desert to stop them from being destroyed, to protect that knowledge for future generations. I would tell that story to my students because those stories survived. Those texts were dug up and the memory of them was told and retold through the generations. Told and retold, you can go to Giordano Bruno in the late 1500s, retelling those stories and getting punished for it. So these are interesting stories. It encourages people to look for the hidden traditions, the traditions that have been curated by shamanic and mystical traditions, the stories of the locals rather than what's in the school textbooks. And so I would tell that story. Those verses, the surrounded by witnesses, the spirits will be speaking with you, teach us to be expectant and to expect guides to come to us in our lives and shape our way forward. If we are alert, we will recognize it. And then I would tell a story that is a personal story. I would tell the story and I would ask my students to interrogate me about it because I would want to teach my hearers to interrogate every story, to listen to the story and then ask all the questions that it's inviting you to ask. Ask, where did this happen? When did this happen? What? Why? Who and how? And to ask each question more than once so that you can get more and more layers out of the story. Now, this is a story, I think the first time I told anyone outside of my family this story, it was to Stephen Strong. And he helped me to see that this is connected. This experience I had is connected with the books that I'm now write, writing, with the Scars of Eden, with Escaping from Eden, and everything I talk about in these books about current patterns and how they relate to paleo contact. These books are full of story. Well, I had this experience before going into the research that produced Escaping from Eden and the Scars from Eden, and this was the experience. I went for a walk one day in the bush in the Yarra Valley. It was a beautiful sunny day. And so I was showing a lot of skin to get as much sunlight on my skin as possible, get my beta endorphins going. I was walking up in the hills, so I was deep breathing and relaxing myself. And I was walking barefoot because I'd learned about grounding or earthing uh, for my health. And it was actually helping my health. It was fixing my sleep apnea. So I had this lovely walk on this beautiful sunny day. And as I was walking along by a river, I realized that something was walking towards me. It was an echidna. And it wasn't just out for a walk near me. It was walking straight to me. It walked right up to me, it stopped at my feet and looked up at me. I thought, wow, what a beautiful experience. Aren't you a beautiful animal? Thank you for coming to say hello. And I just stayed there for a few moments, enjoying the moment of this contact with this animal. It went on for quite some time. And in fact, it only walked away when I walked away. Uh, I wanted to continue my walk, much as I was enjoying that moment, and then it just scuttled off into a corner as I walked away. Wow, that's never happened to me before. I thought, this is, wow, I'll tell the kids about this when I get home. Well, a little further up the hill, I needed to take a pause for a uh, comfort break. And while I was taking a pause, a little mountain pygmy possum scuttled up to my feet and looked up at me. I was astounded. These are beautiful, tiny little creatures. They are protected, and yet it had walked up to me and appeared to be very aware of me. I thought, this is amazing. Aren't you scared, little one? It's lovely to see you. Aren't you gorgeous? And I just enjoyed the moment. A little further on my walk, I realized there were two swamp wallabies that had hopped up to the path 
and were watching me as I walked by. Now, occasionally I did see swamp wallabies out on my walk in this part of the mountain, but usually when I got close enough, they'd hop away. But these had hopped to the path and were watching me as I walked by. I thought this is a wonderful walk. I've never had a walk like this before. I wonder what I'm gonna see next. And as soon as I'd asked myself that question, the picture of a five foot goanna flashed into my mind. I saw the picture and immediately my thinking mind said, oh, Paul, don't be daft. We don't have five foot goannas this far south. They don't live around here. They live up in the hot country. They live up in the Northern Territory. You're not gonna see a five foot goanna here. Four minutes later, right in the middle of the path, looking right at me, a five foot goanna. Well, my jaw dropped and I just stopped and looked at it and it looked at me. I didn't know what was gonna happen next, but was happy to see that it comfortably just ran off into the undergrowth and I continued my walk. Well, I did go home and tell that story to my kids and I thought, what an amazing day I've had. It was really only after I told that story to Stephen Strong that I realized that experience happened right at the beginning of a period of rapid learning for me, rapid reframing, and a really intense period of research that led to escaping from Eden and the scars of Eden. The two are connected somehow. This rapid download, to use that language, followed on from this experience in the bush. So I would tell that story to my students. And then I would ask them to interrogate me, ask those questions. So where did this happen? Oh, it happened in Victoria, like I said, in the Yarra Valley. Where did it happen? Did it happen in a car, in a house? No, it happened out in the bush, in a bit of the bush that I'd been walking for some time. So what happened? I saw some animals. What happened? Actually, some animals came to me and watched me. So when did this happen? Well, it would have been sometime in 2018. When did this happen? Well, specifically it happened after I'd been through a really pressured time in work. It was really hard and I just needed to take some time for my health just to make sure I was looking after myself. I was reflating. I was trying to relax a bit and get myself healthy and, and in a good place. So that's when it happened. Okay, that's interesting. So why do you think it happened? Why do you think the animals came to you? I may have been a bit more in tune with the environment. I mean, I was sunning, I was earthing, I was in my familiar bit of the bush. Maybe I was a less disturbing presence. Why would you be a less disturbing presence? Or well, maybe I'd become a bit more peaceful. I was a bit more peaceful in my spirit and so my presence was less disturbing to the animals. Maybe that was it. So how did it happen? I guess I came quietly, in a quiet spirit, walking quietly, and so I didn't disturb the animals. How did it happen? Well, actually, the animals came quietly to me. So who was it happened to you? Like I said, it was an echidna, a mountain pygmy possum, two swamp wallabies and a goanna. Did anyone else happen to you? Is that the full answer to the who? Well, now you come to mention it. Now I make that connection with a rapid download. I did feel I was getting a lot of assistance with my research. Oh, so there's a connection between the animals coming and your guides coming. And so I'd ask them to interrogate the story to try and tease out some of the meaning of it and some of the layers of it. And so I hope that the experience of sharing that story would teach my students to ask questions of stories told to get out of the story what is within it. I hope it would encourage my hearers to expect something good to come after a time of hardship, as it did for me. Maybe it would encourage them to acquire a peaceful spirit and then see what happens. Maybe it would encourage them to ground and earth and walk barefoot and sun and deep breathe in the bush. Maybe it would teach my hearers to expect that when something catches your attention in this dimension, maybe something is coming to you from another dimension. Perhaps it would encourage my hearers to believe that when an animal connects with you, 
It's actually the universe connecting with you and experiencing you through that animal. Maybe it would encourage my hearers to be alert. Stories are lenses that enable us to see the world around us more clearly. These are some of the stories I would tell. My books, Scars of Eden and Escaping from Eden, are full of ancestral stories from all around the world. I hope I'm learning to be a storyteller. It's certainly in my Welsh heritage, it's there in my African heritage. And so, in a post-apocalyptic world, in a time of shift, I would like to be a storyteller.